right, if you've uh, if you're just sur uh, surfing YouTube and you landed on this one, you might want to hit skip. It's gonna be pretty boring unless you're trying to put an RX1 or an Apex engine into an airplane. That's what we're trying to do here. This is uh, getting close now for me. It's been about a year. I'm a slow worker, but we're getting close. A couple things are not finalized. One would be my exhaust system, and another would be yeah, the wiring. So. Got a little ways to go. We, uh, it's all wired up and hooked up, ready, hopefully, to be testing here before too long. But um, forgive a little bit of that as we walk around it. I just want to show for people that are interested, the two people out there in the world that might care, just a few of the systems on the uh, airplane, the way I'm getting it set up. Some of it's genius and some of it is ludicrous, so it's all subject to uh, to a testing here. And uh, then we'll uh, figure out what works and what needs a little bit of re rework. Uh, we'll start with the fuel system. The fuel system starts down here. It's my input line into my faucet pump. You can read the number on it there. That's the uh, part number for the faucet pump. It has a check valve to keep from going this way, but it does not have a positive uh, shutoff, so it can free flow through this direction. When the pump is running, it's going to pump through this check valve here straight on down to my uh, filter, which is going to get improved later, and into the carburetors. Um, as a secondary pump, I put on one of the Vacuum pumps off the snowmobile here. The snowmobile comes with two. I'm going to try one because I have uh, overhead uh, wing tanks on the plane. And I'm hoping that one will run the engine sufficiently. Here's a vacuum pulse line for that one coming in. So in that loop, the main electric would be off. We'd be running up through here, down through here, and off to the carburetor. I put a check valve in here to make sure that this flow didn't go this way and we end up looping here. So that would force the pressure that way and force the uh, draw up that way. We'll see how it works. Oil system. Here's my tank. I put it up front. It's kind of different, but it worked for me inside my cowl. Um, important thing here, though, is to mount this up in a way that it can flex a little. I got it mounted on this uh, uh, rubber uh, conveyor type strapping on the top and on the bottom here. It gives it a little bit of way to move and avoid a vibration in there. Um, the tanks can kind of crack if they're mounted down and get vibrating too much. This is a dipstick here, and this dipstick has a uh, float switch in it. <laughs> Pretty simple deal. I got it wired up here to run back to the cockpit to uh, one of my um, switches here. Look out. So that uh, alarm will go off when the dipstick level of the oil drops down to a certain point here. It's actually um, quite high. It's about... Uh, a quart low out of the uh, three and a half or four quarts that it holds. So that's kind of nice. If you developed a leak or anything else going on, you'd know about it pretty early on that way, and you'd have hopefully some options. Oil uh, clamps. I, I use for the fuel system the oil. I use the Odecor type clamps. They're said to um, do the best job of handling um, heat and cool cycles. So basically when things heat up, they kind of expand with it, but they keep the pressure on so that when... It cools off, it contracts, and keeps its tension on there. It uh, does that a better job than any, any other type of clamp out there. Uh, routing of the oil, pretty simple. Um, you got two here, the T together. And they come back and go to this forward port on the side. The rear port under the carbs here comes back up and around and goes into this more horizontally mounted input. Right there. Those are uh, fuel uh, oil return lines and uh, breather lines on that side. Here's a crankcase breather right here. I haven't got this figured out quite yet, but it comes out of the engine here. The snowmobile has this oil trap system that usually runs up to the air box to, uh, so it won't burp up any oil into the, uh, into the air box or out of the engine there. Uh, oil pump is down below here. This is the input line for that. This line runs around pretty simply right to the bottom of the oil tank. All right, so that's fuel and oil. I'll probably miss a couple things I'll catch later, but electrical here comes in here. This is my main input for with, off the master switch uh, tied to the battery. So that runs into the uh, starter relay and kind of doubles as a uh, is a uh, power. Um, charging switch um, basically running back to to the battery too. So the, the power comes off the back of the engine and the stator. That comes to the voltage regulator which is right here. 
in the voltage regulator and it comes out regulated at 12 volts, 12 to 14. And that runs back up through the red wire here into the, uh, into the box here. That red wire is always attached to the feed that goes back to the, um, goes back to the, uh, firewall there. Um, what you have here is a ground wire and you have this red and white trigger wire which triggers the, the uh, selenoid in here and that will connect um, this red wire which is this big red wire over to the wire that goes up to the starter. So that's your starter trigger. Make sure uh, you get a good ground in here. I, I like this one right on the side of the starter so I ran that up to the motor mount and I also ran it up to the main bus here and in, inside the cockpit uh, for a double ground um, so that works well I got my ECU mounted up underneath the windshield here and my windshield needs some serious work and buffing um, but it's under the windshield here kind of out of the drip line inside the cockpit kind of rubber mounted there to keep it out of vibration to uh, power the ECU you got this uh, a brown with white um, wire and that's the power source of the ECU that's how you shut the engine off too so this is a this is your uh, very critical wire here to make sure you have power to that. There's also ground wire that runs off it that's just as critical. If you lose that, you're going to lose your uh, ignition to your engine as well. So that's double grounded for me. One across under the panel and one out here on the, uh, on the firewall. I ran two ignition sources in here. One's off the hot battery bus. That one runs up here. And then I got another one, I'll flip the master on here, and I got another one here that runs right off of the stator. Actually took that wire, uh, that um, second um, ignition source off the red wire here before the main fuse, because basically this comes in from your voltage regulator and it's fused to your panel power or in your battery. So if that fuse were to blow, you'd lose power on the main run here. So I took the power off prior to with a five, or that's actually a quick blow three amp fuse on that one going up to the ignition. So you have two sources. The other thing I might do as opposed to running off of this is I might run a small lithium battery pack for that other uh, ignition side uh, power source. All right, to bring that power in, I use, sorry about this, these, uh, they're rated up to 10 amps and 50 volts. They're shot key. Um, uh, diodes. So they're the most efficient, basically, diodes out there. The less voltage drop across them at all. And uh, they're, you know, everybody knows what diodes are, but if you don't, uh, they're just a check valve. So basically, I got an ignition source one coming in here and another coming in here. And then the ECU power, ECU power rather comes off these, which are two tied together on the other side. So one source can come in and feed it. The other source can come in and feed it, but what they can't do is go back the other way. That way, if you have, let's say... A uh, bad battery or short in the system on the uh, on the battery side power feed. Then the uh, other feed right now, either the lithium pack or the stator direct, isn't going to run back and try and feed that bad source. It's just going to run to the ECU only. So it's just kind of a check valve to keep things going in the right direction. All right, it's getting ugly. I lost my flash on the phone here, and my food's about done upstairs. So we're just going to get this done. This is cooling system. Here's your pump. Input line comes here, output to the uh, engine here, and it runs to the side of the block over there. There's a couple other inputs. One is from the carburetors. I'll tell you what's going on there. And one, I think, is an output here going. Let's just take that one first. That one comes up to the engine block here between the carburetors. It's kind of a strange thing. Don't know why Yamaha did it. Maybe there's an air pocket or something in there they wanted to pump some fluid into. Um, so let's start it from the cold side radiator here. Radiator, cold side coming out here comes up we'll talk about the T in a second to the pump um, so when the engine's cold you're gonna be pumping fluid through the engine coming out the top up here and over to the um, thermostat the thermostat is closed you can see that down arrow there bypass the pump now what's that gonna do is it gonna run straight out that bottom when the engine's cold right down to your T and back to your pump. When that thermostat is warm, it's gonna switch the fluid flow and route the fluid into my bottle here. I got my 
coolant temp for the panel here and that's an expansion tank there it gives you a little room for airspace when it's hot or when it cools off rather um, now you're gonna run back down to your radiator hot side and back around to your pump so that's the coal engine bypass loop that's how that works pretty simple but you do need to buy this uh, T to get that in there I also have a pan uh, heat in the cockpit here so it's an alternate radiator, it's a heater core basically with fans on top of it, so it adds a little bit of cooling capacity in the summer time as well. Uh, carburetor heat on the uh, RX-1 at least comes off the top rail here. This is right where the hot uh, fluid comes out of the engine. So it'll come through this pipe here and heat the carburetors. It kind of runs around and through and back down this line back to where we showed you here before. So that's uh, one form of carburetor heat, this is a hot uh, engine coolant, it's really slick. The second is uh, electrical heat, I got it uh, wired up to a switch up front there. That's a, uh, let's see, that's a 30 watts each, 120 watts there on 12 volts. I'm running it off a lighted switch in there with a 10 amp breaker and it's working good so far. And that heats the carburetors electrically from the inside as well. So you got two ways of getting carb heat done there, especially in the cold cold weather or moist air weather whatever it might be whenever you run into icing it's all taken care of there so good great thing about the Yamaha it's got a lot of built-in features built-in oil coolers and and uh, you know it's really compact and all set up really well so it's not, not a lot of monkeying around to do with it to, to get it mounted up it's really been pretty easy just I haven't set my time right to get it all done real quick got other things going on and stuff Let's see, some stuff I missed. Uh, if I didn't mention it, the voltage regular, it's like 15, 20 bucks or something on eBay for a spare one. So I'm going to mount my spare one up right down here on this and just leave it there. It's really pretty light. It's a little bit of weight to it, I guess. But it'd be really simple then just to pull these two plugs and pop off a couple zip ties and plug in there and have that uh, backed up. I'll probably grab an extra ECU too and mount it pretty close to the other one inside there. It's just one big plug on it, so it'd be pretty easy to switch that over if it started getting fritzy or anything. That's like a hundred bucks. I mean, there's cheap backup stuff there to get and have an extra one. Down the years and road, who knows what you might need. And my luck is it takes me out in the middle of a frozen lake in the middle of nowhere is right when I'm going to need it. So I guess I'd kind of probably rather have that stuff along with that and that standard spark plugs and junk like that if i didn't mention i was running a um fuel pressure here into the ca uh, cockpit and it's really kind of slick because with the check valves in the system once you pump the pressure up that pressure should hold and it has held here for a couple days as you can see here we're running a little over three psi and that's where about the pump tops out out and um yeah, I'll, yeah, this is where the passenger sits. That is definitely going to be turbo boost for them. Let me ask what that is. Um, that's a nice check, anyway, on the uh, fuel pressure boost to know that your system's uh, not leaking, and especially that your carburetor bowls aren't leaking. Uh, that, you know, you're not blowing, blowing uh, fuel past the, the, uh, the bowls and uh, floats and needle and seat and everything. So it's kind of a good check of that. So you hit that switch, pump it up, come back a little later on it should have that pressure otherwise you know there's something going on and there it needs your attention before you go flying header design yeah i made all that welded that up yeah right this is from gp headers over in barnesville minnesota and he did just a beautiful job he made the flange you can buy the flange from him if you want to build off that yourself then i did a mock-up kit so over in our uh facebook group yamaha aircraft conversions i help out there little bit and I did a post on uh, building this header basically mock up out of PVC is what I did and I uh, brought it down we obviously got a little work to do here to get it tucked out and under around there that's coming up later but uh, header design this is one and three eighths inch inside diameter tubing this one happens to be 304 stainless and um, the idea is you want kind of equal length on your tubes and you want 24 inches or so on the tube length before you hit the collector and that I'm really glad to get done because that I, I did the mount myself with I had some help welding and painting it but that was a big project and that header was even a big run for me so I was really happy to have have those guys take care of that and get it done right 
Uh, and there are probably three things I want to add, but here's one. It's kind of cool. I didn't forget before I shut this video off here and went to eat is a little tack I bought at Walmart. It's a tack meter, hour meter, really is accurate. I hooked on the snowmobile to check it out and it works just great. Setting number two on that one. The thing was like 11 bucks or something and all it has is a little battery in it to run it back there and then it has one wire comes out and that hooks onto your coil. So you got uh, four coils. So you got kind of four individual coils on this, one on top of each spark plug. There's a big long shaft on that sucker that goes all the way down through the head to the top of the cylinder there where the spark plug is. So there's a big shaft on each of these coils as they go down. And what I did is I just took that wire and wrapped it around about three or four times around that coil uh, shaft down there. That's, so that's where your high voltage side is. This is the low voltage side. Uh, basically a trigger sense uh, signal from your ECU. It comes in and uh, sets off the high voltage side. So I wrapped that around about three or four times, put a little bit of uh, electrical tape around that and a little grease so it all go down in there and it works uh, really good. So cheap and easy, really accurate until you get everything set up. Tachometer is pretty nice to have. All right, this is all I got. Whatever I'm forgetting, I'm sorry. And uh, again, maybe I'll make another video with the changes I do to this thing after I test it out. But there it is, 140 horse sitting on front of an airplane built for 80, so that's going to be nice. And, uh, yep, hopefully have that have uh, some of this stuff tucked away and running here before too long. All right, I'm freezing. It's cold, and I'm time, it's time to eat. See ya.